Uh, my name is Jennifer White. I'm the Director for Learning and Leadership at Futures Without Violence. Um, we are here today for the ILED project, um, part four of our um, web series on um, interactivity and adult learning and um, with this culmination of the second part of storytelling. So we're really excited to be here. Um, before we get started, wanna also give a quick thank you to the Office on Violence Against Women for their continued support of our project and the work that we do. Um, and we're really, we're really grateful um, to have their support. Um, I am so excited for today. Um, we have all uh, been planning this for a long time and um, today's really the culmination in this whole series um, around interactivity and storytelling as a tool for education. Um, and we are thrilled to introduce you all to um, Donnie Rose, who's gonna be leading us today, um, who is a poet um, and a teaching artist and an activist. Um, he's here with us from, originally from Louisiana, our uh, dear Jeremiah Anthony uh, brought him to us, introduced us to him, and we've all been um, working with him on this session. So um, with that, I just wanna say, Thank you for being here, um, Donnie. We're very excited and I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Jennifer. And good afternoon to everyone who is joining us today. Um, so the session I have prepared is titled, I am a living witness, storytelling as a radical method of healing. Um, and I think that storytelling is an important art it's an important uh, skill set that many of us do not always necessarily take into consideration as a means of connecting our humanity. Sometimes we think about storytelling or story time. We think about being little kids and sitting in a circle and you know gathering at someone's foot or a bedtime story. But storytelling has been used, or our narrative is used in uh, business practice in community uh, work and community organizations as a means to connect folks and to exemplify shared experiences. So that's kind of what we're going to go through over the course of the next hour. So I um, have some slides, I have some videos to show you all. We're going to do a couple of writing prompts, but uh, all low stakes, uh, super chill. As Jennifer said, my name is Donnie. Um, I I'm a native of Hydesville, not a native, a resident of Hydesville, Maryland, as of eight months, uh, lived in Baton Rouge for 40 years. I'll be 41 in a couple of weeks. So all I know is Baton Rouge and a little bit of Hydesville. But what I do know of the DMV, I'm kind of into. Uh, what else should you know about me? Um, as she mentioned, I'm a, I'm a poet. I'm the chief content editor for a media outlet called The North Star. Um, I like pasta. I have two cats. Their name are Derek and Jalen, married. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pause it there. All right, so the first thing I want to show you all is a quote from the, Smith, excuse me, the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. Storytelling offers the space to reflect upon and move through past traumas the ability to relish in the beauty of moments long past and ignites the desire to unite with our communities, with ourselves and all forms of healing. So I'm gonna go back and if you can see on the screen, there are certain things that I bolded and highlighted in yellow. First of all, storytelling offers the space. Um, the idea of being allowed space, an opportunity to share our experiences is at the core of what great narrative uh, work looks like. The ability to relish. So again, just, you know, having the opportunity or, or having the, 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 the community and having the resources to share in moments of, you know, either beauty or pain or struggle or whatever it is that connects our humanity and ignites the desire to unite with our community. So, a good story, and as we'll learn about later, like a good seed story often lights a flame under us to want to share um, our story. And so 
by a good story, I don't necessarily mean something that is, you know, super salacious or something that is provocative, but just a story that inspires us to tap into our own humanity and also want to share and be a part of a sharing community. So again, that quote was from the Smithsonian Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage. Here's another quote specific to um, survivors of abuse. This comes from the Connections for Abused Women and Their Children. It is empowering and healing for survivors to share their stories, to share their words, excuse me, and their stories. So when we think about this idea of empowering for survivors to share their stories, why would sharing stories of abuse be empowering for a survivor? Well, it allows a reclamation of spirit. It allows a reclamation of personhood. It takes a level, it, it takes a level of power away from the abuser and allows the survivor to say that this was my experience, but it is not the whole of me. And I'm able to reclaim myself. And then from a healing standpoint, uh, being able to exist and share in community with other people who may have experienced a similar thing, again, reinforces the idea that the experience does not make up the whole of the person. And mm -hmm. that even in their lowest moment, they are still much more than the abuse that they endured at the hands of someone else. So. Again, this is from Connections for Abused Women and Their Children. It's empowering and healing for survivors to share their words and their stories. I want to get into the adult learning theory of storytelling. Uh, so research on narrative learning in adult classroom settings states that narrative is a fundamental human way of making meaning. Learning through stories told, stories heard, and stories recognized allows us to make sense of our experience on a deeper, more cognitive level. Storytelling appeals to listeners on a holistic level and is multifaceted in its approach and benefits to both the storyteller and the story recipient. There's distinct human connection made when we are able to share our stories in a manner that feels safe, intimate, and valued. The restoration of safety and value is vital in the healing process for victims of abuse. So kind of unpacking this idea of making sense of our experience. That is not saying to justify or to rationalize experiences that are that may have been abusive, but it is to say um, this idea of clearing the cobwebs of getting clarity around what may have happened, um, which again attributes to the restoration of safety and value. When you um, people who have experienced uh, intense trauma by way of abuse a lot of times there is a kind of a blocking out or some, some degree of uh, separation from what may have taken place. And so in the, in, in, the, in the midst of storytelling and sharing, it kind of creates some degree of clarity which can aid in the efforts of healing and restoration of safety and of value. So the first thing we're going to do um, activity-wise, we're going to get, we're going to take, um, we're going to, excuse me, we're going to take a, 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 a prompt um, and do a writing exercise for seven minutes. But we're going to break out for a total of 10 minutes. So what's going to happen during that time, we'll take seven minutes to write. And then the remaining time will be for you all to share out, share in your breakout groups. Now, let me say, with respect to the writing time. During the seven minutes of writing, um, I don't want you to focus on anything else but just letting your pen or your, or your keyboard move. Um, it's not a, not a period to engage in you know side chat conversations or anything like that, you're just writing. During the sharing session, the sharing session is going to be voluntary. Um, we're gonna break you all out into small groups and so you won't be overwhelmed with multiple people in your group, but we still want to leave it up to your discretion should you choose to share. But we wanna practice uh, authentic listening and we wanna practice empathy um, 
through this exercise. So um, I encourage you to share, but if not, uh, we also understand that. So let me tell you the prompt and then we'll break you all out. So the prompt is, I was afraid of what would happen if anyone would find out. Now the what can be relative to any experience that you might consider traumatic if it was known to the public. It does not have to be anything as large as say abuse, but anything that was considered traumatic to you and would be considered traumatic to you if the public and by the public, meaning people outside of your immediate circle found out. In your written response, you should, uh, in, the, in, the, in your written response of what happened, you should talk about, in the story, you should talk about what happened, where it happened, who was there slash involved, and why would it create a conflict if it was known to the public? And by a conflict, I mean a conflict for you. So at the basic uh, elements of storytelling, uh, what happened? Where, by where, you know, where was the setting physical? And also where were you in your life? Um, who was involved or who were the characters? What was the conflict? What was the issue that created the traumatic experience for you? All right. So um, my, uh, my my facilitators uh, with Futures uh, Without Violence are going to assist in creating the breakout. And I'm going to set a timer for the seven minutes of writing. So um, if all is, I see the, the rooms are being divvied up right now. And my facilitators, whenever we're ready, let me know and I'll begin the writing time. I think we're ready. Okay. And the prompt is gonna stay right up here. So the seven minutes is beginning now. Again, your prompt, I was afraid of what would happen if anyone would find out. And with the prompt, you don't necessarily have to use that line word for word, but it should be the inspiration for your writing. So the next thing we're going to do in your same breakout groups, we're gonna take three minutes for a brief share out. Again, the share out is voluntary. Um, if, you, if you want to share, um, I would say you don't have to necessarily read everything that you wrote, but maybe think of the kind of fine points of the what and the when and the where and the what happened. Um, if you need to go through um, reading everything in order to flesh that out, then by all means, but most importantly, as someone is sharing, everyone else needs to be authentically listening, um, not playing with any devices or over talking anyone, but just sitting in the moment um, in uh, observation and in respect to what the people in your group are sharing with you. So I'm gonna set the timer for three minutes now. And again, um, sharing is optional and you don't have to read everything that you wrote. So the three minute timer is beginning right now. So I see people are slowly making their way back. All right. So what I want to do right now will be kind of a quick uh, rapid round and you can either choose to come off mute and uh, share or you can drop in the, uh, in the chat. But I just kind of want to know what jumped out at you about that uh, exercise between the prompt and the share and what are some things that stood out to you um, in that exercise. And again, you can drop it in the chat or you can come off mute and share. Uh, 
All right, let's see here. In the chat, someone said, I felt free of something I was carrying for so long. Uh, someone else said it felt like they rambled, a sense of release. Um, anything else that you all want to share about this past uh, exercise? All right, we'll look at one more comment. Including details is very important. Yeah, that is really at the at the core of quality uh, storytelling, quality narrative, sense of details. It was hard and painful to remember that memory. Thank you for sharing uh, sharing that with us. We're gonna go ahead and move on. So the next thing we're gonna look at, um, using an anecdotal approach versus an allegorical approach to storytelling. So an anecdote is a short story about a real person or event, usually serving to make the listeners laugh or ponder over a topic. Generally, the anecdote will relate to the subject matter that the group of people is discussing are discussing. An allegory is a simple story that represents a larger point about society or human nature whose different characters may represent real life figures. Sometimes situations in the story may echo stories from history or modern day life without ever explicitly stating this connection. So an anecdote deals with a real person or a real event usually kind of has a humorous undertone, whereas an allegory is a story that uh, embodies something that could have happened, but does not necessarily represent a real person or event. Allegorical approaches to storytelling are beneficial in communities that are newly formed. Whether it's school communities, workplace communities, an allegorical method can allow participants to convey their positions on certain topics by providing familiar examples of cautionary tales while not disclosing a great deal of their personal narrative. Communal trust is built over time and everyone who enters the space does not come in prime to give first person accounts of the experiences they've had, particularly if their experiences relate to trauma. Allegory provides a sense of distance for newly formed communities to test the temperature of the people around them. So again, uh, an allegory kind of functions as this story of, uh, so I heard of this thing that happened or it, it kind of has a, a fictional uh, vibe about it, which allows for communities that are newly formed to kind of get an idea of what type of experiences are being brought into those communities without necessarily having people tell first person accounts of things that went on with their life. Um, a thing I want to pinpoint again is the line where it says communal trust is built over time. Uh, for me, I worked with young people, uh, youth spoken word poets and young artists for well over a decade. And there's one thing that I learned, if nothing else, that communal trust is indeed built over time. People don't just come into spaces willing to just open themselves up to complete strangers. And the way the trust is built over time is people being willing to listen, being willing to uh, express empathy, being willing to stand as witnesses for the stories that they are being told. All right, now to talk about anecdotes. An anecdotal approach to storytelling, anecdotal approaches to storytelling are of greater benefit to communities seeking to deepen trust within a group after the group members have spent time learning about each other on a surface level. A willingness to be vulnerable and honest must be at the forefront when sharing either personal narratives or stories of people we know of or align with ideologically. The more time people in a community spend with one another, the less likely individuals will have deep concerns of being judged. I'm gonna read that again. The more time people in a community spend with one another, the less likely individuals will have deep concerns of being judged and therefore more likely to be open about real world scenarios that they've been impacted by. Because of the humorous nature of an anecdotal storytelling, community members who have gained some degree of familiarity with each other are less likely to feel embarrassed by sharing stories of blunder and more comfortable with exchanging cautionary tales to help each other avoid similar mistakes. Communities that have built trust may employ a more serious form of anecdotal storytelling when unpacking traumas within a group. So, um, again, the anecdote has uh, is by definition 
more whimsical and humorous in nature, but in reference to dealing with stories of trauma and abuse, um, you will not get first person accounts in communities where trust has not been built and where people have not spent a considerable amount of time getting to know each other and lessening kind of their defenses of feeling uh, judged or the perception of being judged. We're gonna look at an example of a story of abuse. Trigger warning, there are graphic uh, images and story and a story of domestic violence. So I'm going to share this now and then we'll talk a little bit about it. They did think I was going to die. You know, they, they they said that to my parents. You know, the next 24 hours are vital if we, we're not sure how um, this is going to, you know, going to pan out. But I think it's important that that has happened and I am here and now I've got to move that into, a, I've got to change it into a positive and, and help other people to not go through the same. So I'm their hindsight. That's what I would say. I'm, you know, they, they can look at me and think, Excuse me, I'm sorry about that. It would never happen to me, though, that he would never do that to me. How many times did I say that? You know, he'll never hit me. He's never hit me before. I was in a relationship for just under seven years. They did think I was going to die. You know, they, they, they said that to my parents. You know, the next 24 hours are vital if we, we're not sure how... Um, this is gonna, you know, gonna pan out. But I think it's important that that has happened and I am here and now I've got to move that into, a, I've got to change that into a positive and, and help other people to not go through the same. So I'm their hindsight, that's what I would say. I'm, you know, they, they can look at me and think, it would never happen to me though, that he would never do that to me. How many times did I say that? You know, he'll never hit me, he's never hit me before. I was in a relationship for just under seven years um, with um, somebody who drank an awful lot and um, did a lot of drugs. And I always felt that um, it, it would never happen to me. I would never be the victim of violence. Um, and I didn't appreciate <clears throat> that the situation I was in was controlling. I felt that I was in control. Um, so now being removed from the situation after what happened um, and looking at it with fresh eyes, I can see that a lot there is a lot more to the relationship that I wasn't aware of. Um, and I think it's important to make people aware um, that there's help out there that can kind of help guide you at the time in a nice way rather than insulting you and you getting defensive. Because that's what I used to do a lot. At Christmas, I would go to my parents on Christmas Day and Matt would be there and they'd say, oh, what did you get? And I would reel off this list of things that I wanted that I never got. In seven years, I never got a Christmas card. I never got a birthday card. I never got a present. But to everybody else, they would think that he bought me a Michael Kors watch or um, the car or everything that I had, I bought and I made out that he did because I really believed in my head that if I believed that, then no one would be able to trip me up. So if you're telling a fib, you've got to kind of believe it because if someone tries to catch you out and you can't remember what you've said. So I'd kind of find it easier to believe the stories that I told. Therefore, I seemed really happy and I'd go to work and, you know, oh yeah, Matt, you know, we went to the cinema last night and, you know, yes, I may have gone to the cinema, but he would have to have a beer to sit in that cinema with me and I would have had to have bought him something to bribe him to go with me. You know, it was never from the goodness of his heart, but but I would sugarcoat that and say, oh, yes, but we went to the cinema and we had a really lovely time. We went for dinner. I paid, but we went for dinner. And it was... So that's why I always seemed to everybody else on the outside that my relationship was perfect, too perfect, but perfect because I just spun myself these little stories that I chose to believe. When I was in that bubble, I never realised how controlling um, Matt was. Um, I used to be the person that begged him back. So it was never violent. He'd never, he'd never hit me before. Yes, he drank. 
and he would smash something if he didn't get his own way. He'd put a fist through a wall. And, and as uncomfortable as that made me feel, I'd think, oh, yes, but he's always hit an inanimate object. He's never hit me. Um, so that's just aggression, and that's his, that's his way of dealing with it. And I'd say, I need you to leave. I don't feel comfortable. Um, I need you to go. And he'd, he'd quite, you know, happily say, OK, well, I'll pack a bag and I'll leave. And then he'd leave, wouldn't answer a phone, wouldn't text, wouldn't... And, and then I'd, feel, I'd find myself ringing, uh, you know, please come back, I'm worried, you know, I'm worried that you're sleeping on a park bench, because that was his control, he made me feel guilty, he made me feel sorry for him, and then he knew every time he'd come back, I wouldn't, I would glaze over the situation that had just happened, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, you, you made me feel uncomfortable, because you just put your fist through the wall, I would feel like I would be falling over myself to make him feel that that's it, make him feel better about the situation that had happened. Your friends will help you and your family will help you. It's just that you've got to accept that what happens to you isn't isn't anything to be ashamed of. Um, it's something that um, it happens quite a lot. Um, and, yeah, people will help you. You just need to be honest. There's campaigns, Women's Aid, um, domestic violence um, websites um, that you can look at. But I always found that um, staying safe in a relationship wasn't something that people would know was available. So if you're in a relationship and you feel, for example, on the particular day that my attack happened, um, I felt I had like a, a, a sick feeling, I, I, you know, I had this kind of gut instinct as such, um, that something wasn't right. Um, he, he wasn't right that day. He was um, either too attentive or um, just completely different, and it made me feel uncomfortable. Um, if I'd have known that there were numbers I could have called rather than trying to deal with it on my own and going home and sort of thinking I'm safe at home, I would have been able to have got some advice, um, which would have been really helpful because maybe the situation wouldn't have happened. Essex Police were, were really good um, for my family as well. I think that's important to remember that th this doesn't just affect the victim. It, it has a, a really big effect on their family because they feel quite useless as well. They feel like they should have, you know, hindsight, they should have done something, they should have removed you from that situation. Um, but I think they probably did, I just didn't listen. Um, and so Essex Police have been really supportive to my family as well. All right. So in reflection from that video, would Haley's story be considered allegorical or anecdotal? Um, not by the technical definition of anecdote, because of course it was nothing light or humorous, but it was anecdotal in the sense to where it was told from a first person account. It was not a reference of something, it was actually Haley telling her story. Um, what jumped out to you about her narrative or short story sharing? So in the chat, you can you know, just write your ideas of what are some things that jumped out to you about her um, sharing her story. And then also a follow-up to that, what kind of community trust would have to be established for someone to share a similar story with a group? So in the chat again, you can list out things that jumped out to you about her sharing her story. And also what are your ideas of the type of community trust that would be that would have to be necessary for someone to share that in a group, because this video was uh, filmed for an organization, but it was obviously uh, she recorded it in isolation. So if you imagine Haley telling that same story amidst a group, what type of community trust would have to be established, and what are some things that jumped out to you? So I'll give us a couple of moments to just respond via the chat and we'll look at what we have here.
All right, I see the storyteller was genuine and vulnerable. Um, also under what would be necessary for that type of uh, story to be sold, told within a group, excuse me, maybe a support group setting, all right? What are some other things that jumped out to us about Haley's story and what type of setting would be necessary? Um, she would have to feel supported and not, not doubted and judged, absolutely. Um, which kind of goes back to what we were talking about in the previous slide, the community book, trust is built over time and that people have to feel like they're not in an environment where they'll be judged. A non-judgmental and non-victim blaming setting, absolutely. Haley may ask for confidentiality from the group, definitely. Um, if you are to engage in storytelling practices within uh, your groups or organizations, confidentiality has to be a must. Open and not ashamed. Community trust would be that she was believed and not judged, absolutely. Um, and I think that first part about uh, we're jumping out her being open and not ashamed is critical to the idea of folks uh, storytelling and sharing uh, trauma-informed events. All right, you all can continue to add to the chat. I will move to the next slide though. All right, so the next slide looks at identifying the narrative arc in stories of survival. So a narrative arc is a term that describes a story's full progression. It usually evokes the idea that every story has a relatively calm beginning, a middle where tension happens, character conflict, and narrative momentum that builds to a peak, and an end where the conflict is resolved. For survivors of domestic abuse or sexual assault, the idea of a narrative arc can begin as early as childhood or young adulthood. It can persist for a number of years. It could be comprised of multiple villains and it can end with a great deal of trauma informed therapy or counseling needed for the survivor to fully be able to comprehend what has happened to them. All right, and we'll look back at the chat. Uh, so it was also said that Haley was able to tell the story with a certain sense of distance that trauma had been or was actively being worked with. Uh, absolutely, that's, that's a very solid point. We're gonna look at another video real quick. Um, this is a story of sexual assault. The trigger warning is that it does include very explicit details of assault. So um, whatever you need to do uh, in this particular moment while you're viewing, if you need to at some point, uh, the video is about five and a half minutes, but if you need to um, turn down your volume or step away, uh, whatever you need to do to take care of yourself. But we're gonna watch this video and then talk a little bit about it after we're finished. I had a very happy childhood. My father was um, army. For a very long time, I didn't know what regular time was. It was always military time. So I would say 1300 and the other kids wouldn't know what I was saying. I didn't join the military until I was 30. Um, it was always something that I wanted to do. I wanted to show my sons the example of what my father showed me as a young girl. It was about a month into my uh, service that I started receiving unwanted comments from a superior there. It escalated to where he grabbed me by the top of my head and he pushed my head into his genital area while telling me what my lips would feel like. After the investigation, he was flown off of the ship and um, he was removed of his rank. Rumors start spilling out and the treatment that I received after that was that it was my fault that I took his rank from him. I was now the person that was going to go to someone else's uh, division and empty their water bucket or I was now going to work nights. I just felt like I had to get away from it all to actually start brand new. I decided to move my children and I to Italy. And I went there as an aviation administration man. 
they immediately saw that I had experience and you know requested that I actually take over that particular program and I gladly accepted. There was a coworker. He was a real genuine friend. He came over and joined us to cook. I told everyone good night. I went upstairs to my room and I locked the door. I was very startled when uh, the door opened. I heard the voice of my coworker. I got scared. Right off, he actually tried to put his, he tr in my mouth and I refused to open. I just kept my mouth closed and I closed my eyes really, really tight. It didn't matter to him. As he was attempting to <laughs> penetrate me, I heard my son at the door. And the way he darted to that door I was afraid that he was going to <laughs> But he barricaded the door to <laughs> keep my son from coming in. And he explained to my son <laughs> that he was taking care of me. I did not want my children to know, but my son walked. <laughs> all the way up there to the front gate and uh, notified security. The NCIS agents assured me we have never had this much evidence. They had pictures of the door where he actually uh, maneuvered the lock to get into my room. They had my clothing where my zipper was broken and his fingerprints on my articles of clothing. They had his DNA on my comforter. They found his DNA inside my rape kit. He was still found not guilty of anything. And the explanation that I got and I quote, it's no question that his genitals touch your genital area, but it's reasonable to believe that he believes that he had your consent. I received the blue jacket of the quarter, which basically is when they award who was the best of that particular quarter. I had to submit a PTS, and it's basically where you ask, can you re-enlist? My PTS came back denied, which was very shocking for me, as well as for my superiors. I accepted the fact that the military was now done with me, and I went back to school. I received my master's degree, which was very exciting. I took the opportunity to show my children that I was not completely beaten. I had to get my life back. I had a very happy... All right. So... Oh, excuse me. So that was a very, very... Um, gripping, visceral story. And again, um, I hope that you did whatever you needed to do um, if you needed to step away from that. So the narrative arc in Darshell's story of sexual assault consisted of memories of being a proud daughter of a military man. Her father was in the military. Eventually she would join the armed services later in life and then become a victim of assault by more than one military personnel member. 
uh, Darshel's resolution was not that simple as being able to retain her standing in the military despite being a decorated soldier. So she talked about getting the um, the blue jacket, this this accomplishment uh, for being at the top of her of, of her military profession. But then when she attempted to reenlist, uh, they told her no, which as she kind of described, having to come to terms with the military being done with her. So there's a added layer of trauma on top of the abuse and the assault that she endured, uh, which was the thing that she grew up uh, wanting to be a part of and wanting to be basically dismissed her because apparently they viewed her as a troublemaker or someone that would create um, unnecessary uh, just discord within within the service. So if Darshan was ultimately not allowed to re-enlist in the military, what could be considered a benefit of her coming forth with her story of assault? So um, I'm gonna ask you all this real quick. Uh, so again, she, she went back to school, she got a master's, she was able to kind of pick up with uh, with her life after such a traumatic moment. But if she was no longer able to serve in the military, what do we think was the benefit of her even coming forth with the story of assault to her superiors? Um, so we can put in the chat, what, what, what are some of our ideas as to what was the benefit of her doing so if it did not end up with her being able to re-enlist in the service? Um, all right, someone said awareness of the injustice in the system. Correct. Um, if she if she was not able to regain enlistment, then at the very least, she opened the door for that type of conversation to exist within higher ups in the military. Her own empowerment, absolutely. Um, that again goes back to this idea of reclamation of value and reclamation of, of power. It is about her healing, which is a part which in part is sharing her story. Thank you for that. Yeah, she did that for herself, even if it did not result in her being, you know, even if the resolve was not, you know, one of her being able to be reenlisted in the service. The benefit is for her alone, so she was able to tell her story and she was able to move on with a more empowered sense of self. Absolutely. And so um, I'm glad that you all are communicating that these ideas through the chat, because should you choose to opt, uh, should you you know decide to engage in this kind of storytelling in your groups and in your organizations, or, or people within your organizations or communities uh, tend to do you know should choose to do so? Excuse me. Then I don't want you to move forward thinking that every resolve is a quote unquote happy ending. Um, in Darshel's case, she was able to go on again with her life, get a degree, but her ending was not necessarily happy in a sense to where she got to be back in the military, but it did allow her her own sense of empowerment and her own healing. And so some of the stories that we may come in contact with, some of the stories that we may hear may not have what is considered a conventional happy ending. But what we may consider a happy ending versus what may be peace of mind or resolve for the person that's telling the story may be completely different things. And then someone else just added, um, empower other survivors in similar situations. Let's see, we should always believe someone's experience as they see it, not how we imagine their experience to be, absolutely. It didn't give her the outcome she wanted, but it opened the door for her to have a happy ending, just not the one she was expecting. So that's another important point. Right. Who knows if she would have went on to pursue her master's degree had she been able to reenlist in the military. She may have just stayed 
you know, moving along in the military, possibly going up the rank, but she may not have been able to set this other example for her children, right? So um, thank you all for all your responses. We're gonna do a quick writing uh, prompt. So um, the prompt is, I knew I had to say something, whether anyone believed me or not. And I want you to write about a time you had to speak out about an injustice or a violation. The story of violation can be whatever level of extremity you feel comfortable with writing about. So again, it does not have to be anything as um, jarring as abuse. It could be any level of violation. I'm not gonna ask you all to get into breakout groups here because there won't be any sharing out. This will just be three minutes of independent writing time. So again, the prompt. I knew I had to say something, whether anyone believed me or not. And it's gonna be about a time that you felt um, an injustice was done to you or you felt violated. And you're just gonna write about um, the time that that happened. And we're just gonna take um, three minutes to do so. So I'm setting a timer for three minutes now. And you all may get started. And Donnie, I think we were saying too that they could write about if they were speaking out about one that happened to someone else too, right? Not just yeah, them. Yeah, that's, yeah. yeah that's, that's fine as well. Um, okay. Yeah, so I guess you can look at it from an allegorical standpoint, maybe from a distance or anecdotal. But yeah, a time when you or someone else um, experienced an injustice or violation. Um, I will say that if you are going to be writing about someone else, that you write from the perspective of what you knew about it and not from a perspective of what you thought that they felt. So you can write what you felt about something happening to someone else, but do not try to um, write their feelings, if that makes any sense. All right, take about another minute. And you can start bringing your writing to a close. We just have a few more seconds. All right, so the time is up on that. And I want you all to just hold on to those writings because you may end up using that at a later time in your respective groups, communities, organizations, kind of as a seed story. And I'm gonna get into the concept of what a seed story is with the last thing that I wanna uh, go over with you all. So practicing the art of group storytelling through story circles. 
the rules of the story circle are the rules of civil participation in society. You agree to listen, you agree to respect. Uh, that is a quote from John O'Neill. He's the founder of June Bug Productions, which is a theater company based out of New Orleans. Story circles allow participants to practice authentic listening, being present in the moment, and honoring the experiences of everyone involved. Facilitators of story circles that are trauma-informed have an important obligation to adhere to the following guidelines of story circles to ensure that participants feel safe and open in their sharing. I'm gonna switch my screen share now to pull up uh, this document from June Bug Productions around storage, uh, around, excuse me, storage service. So one moment here. All right. So about the story circle. Um, there are four parts to a story circle. Part one, introductions and explaining the guidelines. Part two, listening and telling. Part three, crosstalk. And part four, transformative action. I'm going to go through some of the fine points here, but this is a, um, a resource document that was shared with Futures Without Violence, so you'll be able to have access to it. All right, number one, always sit in a circle. Number two, always introduce everybody. Number three, be transparent about the purpose and theme for the circle. Uh, I'm gonna go into a little bit more depth with that. If there is to be a theme given, hold on a second. All right, so people, is anyone, uh, can can you all see the document now? Then? No, we can just, just see your download folder. All right, give me one second here. Um, I will take care of unraveling. One moment. Sorry about that. I got this. Yeah. How about how about now? Can yeah, see? we we can see it now. All right. Sorry about that. Let me go back. So there are four parts to a story circle. Part one, introductions and explaining the guidelines. Part two, listening and telling. Part three, crosstalk. Part four, transformative action. So here are the basic steps of the story circle. I'm going to expound upon a couple of those, but really just walk you through each. Number one, always sit in a circle. Number two, always introduce everybody. Number three, be transparent about the purpose and the theme for the circle. There's a theme to be given for the stories. The facilitator explains the theme and answers any questions about that theme or about the process itself. It matters so that the participants can support the reason for the gathering. Don't get too worried about the theme because the only person who really needs to concern themselves with the theme is the person telling the first story. Number four, one person speaks at a time. Number five, the first story is the seed that grows what stories get told. So I just mentioned something about uh, what you just wrote could be potentially a seed story for a future story. So, so I'm gonna unpack that a bit. The facilitator may have prompted someone to tell the first story or the facilitator may call for the first story and anyone in the circle may begin with a story. It depends on the facilitator. The purpose of the circle or how well the people know each other. So the first story, again, is the seed story that kind of shapes the theme of what stories will be told in the circle. Number six, the most important part of storytelling is the listening. So again, uh, going back to this idea of authentic listening, um, there's not a competition in who can tell the most dramatic story or whose story is filled with the most trauma. It's just a matter of people within the circle practicing listening. That's the most important part of it. Number seven, have a timekeeper and share time equally. Uh, suggest a time per story is about three minutes. So, you know, some people have a tendency to be long-winded uh, and, you know, we want to honor what people are sharing, but we also wanna make sure that we give time for everyone to be able to share. Number eight, the story circle will proceed clockwise from the first storyteller. So if you're sitting in a circle, the first person goes, 
and it moves along clockwise. Number nine, this is very important. You can pass. You don't have to speak. So if you are facilitating a story circle, it should be understood that everyone is not obligated to speak. If someone in the circle does not want to share, they just say pass, and then the next person going clockwise would go if they choose to go. Number 10, very important. The stories you tell should be stories, not political theories, general histories, or your opinion on the theme or your opportunity to lecture. A story can be your story or the story of a family member, friend, or acquaintance, but most importantly, it is a story. Number 11, be present. So make sure you're not playing with your phone or texting or Twitter or anything like that. Um, concentrate on listening. Number 12, silence is okay. In fact, it is good. So as the stories pass around the circle, it is okay for there to be silence after one story is complete. Um, that also indicates authentic listening. Number 13, respect. You don't have to like the story someone has to tell, but you have to respect their right to tell it. Uh, 14, if your circle has time for more than one circle of stories and at the end, do it again. Um, ending with an opportunity for those who have passed if they now have a story. So let's say you are in a two hour uh, workshop session and let's say 45 minutes is designated to using story circles. You may go, go through your first rotation um, and then you may have time for another seed story to kick off another circle. And then the people who may have passed the first time around may feel compelled to share the second time around. Number 15, crosstalk. After everyone who is going to tell has spoken, open the circle for the crosstalk, questioning, comments, and dialogue. You need to have decided how long you have for that phase of the circle and keep to that time. So let's just say, hypothetically, you have 12 people in your circle. Everyone talks for three minutes and you allow 10 minutes for crosstalk. Crosstalk is the only time when dialogue and commentary about stories that were shared should happen. In other words, you're not responding right after someone shares their story and you're not responding in the moment, but you are taking mental note of what you heard throughout the circle so that when the crosstalk opportunity comes up, then you can go forth with commenting and dialogue. Number 16, snapshots. You may do a snapshot to capture what you hear and the stories people share. Take a moment to collect the sensations, thoughts, images, and feelings you have as the result of listening. Um, number 17, transformative action. Finally, always end the circle with an opportunity for people to do something with what has been shared. That action be, can be small and simple, like sharing a thought or feeling, and it can be creative and artistic, like, for example, uh, writing a poem or something to that nature. So always allowing for opportunity for people to um, utilize some level of transformative action. All right. So I know that was a lot. And again, that is, excuse me, again, there is a, you have the ability because there is the, um, Sorry, I'm trying to click on something here, having a bit of a bit of an issue. So there's the ability to go with what has been presented in the uh, form to utilize. So you don't have to have all the answers right now. All right. So I know we just covered a good bit um, from talking about story circles to anecdotal stuff versus allegory to just the various ways in which storytelling can be used as a tool, a reference, uh, a source of healing um, when dealing with um, instances of trauma-informed communication. So now I wanna pause to see if anyone has any questions about some of the things that we just covered, uh, comments, thoughts, um, any uh, any intent of applying it in your own communities or groups? So the floor is open.
All right, I got um, I got to thank you, uh, and I appreciate you for uh, being with me this time. And uh, Wei uh, Wei Mai said that they are going to looking forward to exploring the implementation with their group. That's great news. Um, anyone else have questions or comments or things that they want to share or something that maybe you learned, uh, something that you're taking away from this particular session? Um, Donnie, I just was curious about something. I, um, you know, reading the story circle um, directions or the break, the, the premises behind it, it reminds me a lot of the way that um, a lot of recovery programs are run. So like substance abuse recovery, like they often model similarly that somebody shares a story and people use that story to share their own things and the limits on crosstalk and stuff like that. And I'm, I'm curious if you have any exposure to that, if it's um, like, if, if those origins are similar um, for in purposes of like telling stories and recovery in general, different recovery groups. So the only actual um, knowledge I have of that, some somewhat of personal experience. So I remember when I was nine years old, my dad went to a facility called the Toss Center um, for alcohol uh, rehab. And you know, funny that you you would ask that question because it immediately now jogs in my memory, and it's interesting how memory works. Of myself and my family being in a setting with my dad's rehab counselor. But we had to talk about a time that his alcoholism directly impacted our family. And we all ended up telling the same story of one time when he almost burned our house down because he was- I gotta get a silent one, that's a specific um, Yeah, one time he almost set our house on fire after passing out from drinking. And so there is that parallel from that standpoint of what is considered crosstalk in story circles and what would be considered this kind of open sharing in a rehabilitative uh, setting. So mm -hmm. there, 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 there are similarities there. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you so much. I found this really, um, just I learned so much from it. So I really appreciate you taking us through this. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone else have questions or comments regarding um, storytelling as a radical method of healing. Or just any, any comments and any, any thoughts or questions in general. Um, I wanna ask you all and you can respond via the chat or you can come on. How might you be able to incorporate this in the work that you do on a regular basis? Um, where might you find any of these ideas useful? All right, something comes up in the chat. Um, so the question, where have you led story circles with what type of people? It's all good. So I primarily led story circles amongst uh, young people, teenagers in particular. Um, I worked as a teaching artist and as a youth development uh, professional, as a manager for an after-school program. So I primarily have incorporated the story circle technique with, with uh, young people, with, with teens and uh, adolescents. All right. Um, the circle would be great to use in a support group. Yep, absolutely. Um, the main thing is when you're dealing particularly in a group uh, with people who have experienced, you know, certain traumas is that you set those ground rules very early and you make sure that people adhere to them. Because um, when you're talking about dealing in support groups where the goal is uh, to produce healing, there has to be, like the, the safety has to be maintained in a very direct way. All right, uh, our support for frontline workers and advocates. Yep. Um, 
because when you talk about the idea of frontline workers and advocates for people who have endured abuse, either domestic violence or sexual abuse, like they are hearing these stories all the time, right? They are um, providing resources to folks at all times. So this also is taking a wear and tear on their psyche. So it may be a benefit for just those advocates to do story circles amongst themselves where they could have private uh, sharings about, not about things people told them, but just about their experiences in the field. Um, someone else said, we have this community group meeting monthly with domestic violence survivors who speak four to five different languages with interpreters present for sure. I want to explore whether the story circle would be possible. I think that would be a tremendous idea. Maybe what you want to do is if you can have, if, if the group is, if there's enough numbers to segment the story circles per language, then you may want to do that. So the story circle for uh, French speakers may consist of just three people. For Spanish speakers, it may just consist of you know, three people for Mandarin speakers, for et cetera, et cetera, right? So you may break that down and you may not be dealing with the larger group, but you may like segment it into groups based on the language that is spoken and having the uh, appropriate interpreter go with uh, each group. Uh, Jennifer says, I'm thinking we do a session for, ju for judges on a vicarious trauma and I can see something like this working. Good. Um, let me know if you need any additional resources on it. And, uh, you know, whatever whatever um, I could do to help. Um, cool. So I don't know if you all can see my last uh, screen where it says, thanks for participating. Maybe you can, maybe you can't. But it has my contact information here. Um, can, it, can you all see that screen? Do you see the screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So, um, my website is Donnie D O N N E Y dot not not dot rose Donnie Rose dot info. My email is Donnie dot rose at gmail dot com. Um, again, my forte is primarily uh, teaching creative writing and creative writing exercises and working with young people and you know like writing based stuff. So. If you need additional supports or resources around prompts and things of that nature, like let me know. Um, I'm also um, I'm also a performance poet, um, so I can you know show up at certain settings, you know, and you know deliver material that is related to a subject area that you all may need. Um, yeah. Um, I also do teach creative writing workshops again, like in person. And so I know that as we are navigating the kind of in and kind of not in the pandemic and people are like going back and forth with, you know, physical in-person stuff, uh, be sure to keep me in mind. I'm, you know, I'm new to the area and I want to get out and get to uh, know the, the community around me. So that's it for me. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, um, Donnie. It was a, such a, a wonderful experience to have you here with us. Um, and um, just, we have so much gratitude for you coming in and sharing your art with us. Um, for everyone participating, um, thank you. If you've been with us through all four sessions, um, we hope that you've enjoyed them um, and that you will continue to have questions and contact us and um, continue to engage with all this material. Um, we will send you all an evaluation um, separately, not um, through this Zoom, but um, we'll send you evaluation separately and you can let us know um, what you were able to get out of it and, and what else you would like to see um, on these webinars. So um, thank you again to, to, to Donnie and to uh, Mary Kate, and thank you to Jeremiah Anthony and Rebecca for helping to pull all this together. Um, and to all of you for being here with us through all these sessions. So um, we appreciate you and hope you have a great rest of the day. Bye y'all. Thank you so much, Donnie. All right, thank you all.